welcome back to another episode of my blue jl and it's a beautiful day in the pacific northwest finally time to take off the hood but this is not what i'm here to show you it's going to be right here you can't see it but you will and this is basically how not to paint your dash you know there's this famous saying of you learn from your mistakes and i learned a lot in this episode and i'm going to show you some of the pitfalls and mistakes so you don't have to make them well if you also want to paint your dash and i gotta say it is well worth the effort because it looks absolutely gorgeous i wish i could turn the camera around and show you what it looks like but but this is just going to be a little bit of a tease and you're going to have to wait a little bit longer in order to see this and trust me it'll be worth it now i want to preface this to say that while watching this video don't follow me yeah, because i am going to make a lot of mistakes but i am also going to point them out and show you how not to make the same mistakes and that's going to be the important part so be sure to watch the entire video so you don't make the same mistakes i do overall taking the dash apart was not a big deal uh, the only scary thing is, is dealing with the airbag that's behind the passenger side panel. And honestly, once you disconnect the power, there's no fear of that going off. These things are engineered in a way to never explode without the proper charge being given by the car during an emergency situation. But there's a lot of checks and balances to keep it from going off, so you don't have to worry about that. The only thing you really have to worry about is well, making some mistake like scratching your paint or using the wrong masking tape. And trust me, I have got a ton of mistakes that I will make so you don't have to so make sure to watch it all and hopefully yours goes a lot better than mine did now before we get into the grocery list let me remind you to smash that like button it really helps me out and the channel a lot also if you like this content and want to see more consider subscribing and checking out some of my other videos now let's get into it now on first blush one might think that the grocery list might be limited to just a couple of cans of your uh, favorite colored spray paint to really do the job and honestly i found out that couldn't be further from the truth let's go ahead and list the supplies you're going to need to properly do this job so yes you will need a good can of spray paint in the color of your choice i personally chose body color which is the ocean blue because i really like my jeep color next we're going to want a primer to give it a good base and a clear coat to protect it so make sure to get that stuff too and of course we're going to need some general painting supplies like some masking tape and some drop cloth so make sure to get those too and also let's not forget the car polish because we're really kind of want to make this thing shine. In total, you should be probably out about 50 to 60 bucks in supplies. Not a bad deal. That is unless you do it the wrong way. Here, let me go ahead and tell you some of the extra supplies I had to buy. I decided to have some custom vinyl decals made just for this project. And then I had to get a vinyl cutting machine with extra vinyl transfer tape and other supplies once I ruined the custom vinyl decal that I had made for me. And let's not forget a headlight restoration kit because, well, why not? Giving me personally a grand total of well over $300. Way too much money to spend on this project. So let's go ahead and get into what went wrong and where honestly that headlight restoration kit comes into play here. Now, CJ Offroad has already done a great video on how to remove these interior panels from your Wrangler or Gladiator. And so I'm not going to redo what they've already done. What I will do for you is point out some of the possible difficult points that you may run into while removing your interior. Some of these points are not mentioned in the CJ video and it may save you some time in from finding them for yourself. Now after securing your battery, making sure the Jeep has no power whatsoever to it, one of the first things we're going to do is take apart the center console. The trim removal tool helped a lot, but the amount of force needed to pop the first couple of clips was a bit disconcerting. As long as you start from the sides though, you should have no problems. Once the clips start to pop out though, be careful of the wires still connected to the controls and the start stop button. Once the HVAC panel is off, it's just two screws plus some clips to take the touch screen bezel off. And one single screw holding the dash shade on. The dash shade is a long strip that runs the entire length of the interior and is held on by about 20 very firm clips. The screw is more of a securing mechanism to hold it on in place. This piece was the single most difficult part to remove and found that starting from either the driver's side or the passenger side works best. This is held in with not just these plastic little clips, but metal clips that have alligator teeth in it. 
pulling these free takes a lot of force and you may damage a clip or two uh, pulling it out. If you do damage some of the clips it's easy just to reverse the gator teeth and put them back in easy. Once the shade is off the driver's side is really easy. Just two screws that the shade was covering and it pops out with just a couple of clips. Real simple. The next part is going to be the hard part which is the passenger side. Removing these two bolts and taking off the passenger's oh shit bar helps removing the panel a lot since it gives you easy access to the screws holding it in. Removing these six screws was the easiest part compared to what's coming up next. Because after taking out the glove box, you're going to have to unplug the airbag and remove two bolts that are up underneath the dash. After that, the second and final dash piece should just slip right out, along with the passenger airbag. Now that the really hard part is done, let's go ahead and move on to prepping and painting. For the air vents, I decided removing them rather than masking them would actually be a bit of a time saver and it turned out it was. All it is is just three screws holding on each air vent and each air vent is actually uniquely shaped for its position. So when you put them back, if it doesn't fit, that means you got the wrong one. I also decided to mask up the passenger airbag instead of trying to remove it from its housing. I even took it a step further and removed some metal trim pieces that are around the gauges that are held in by some clips in the back. I plan on painting these matte black as a nice subtle contrast between the glossy blue that I plan on using on the dash. After using some rough sandpaper to scuff up the surface, I was ready to primer it. Now remember how I said this was a lesson how and how not to paint your dash. Well, this is one of my first mistakes, and if you notice what's on my table, it's a piece of 80 grit sandpaper. This was a massive error on my part and would haunt me through the rest of the project. Don't use 80 grit sandpaper, it's just too rough. Use the 800 grit that I mentioned in the shopping list. The 80 left some very deep scratches and grooves that could even be seen through their primer and even into the base color. So do not do this. Now the reason why we're sanding the surface is to help promote a good bond with the paint. The paint likes fresh plastic and a lot of surface area. I even sanded the metal rings, which actually turned out to be plastic. With that, it's time for the primer. Make sure you get a good sandable primer that's formulated for plastics. About two coats should do it, allowing for a few minutes between coats to cure. And after about 24 hours to make sure it cures fully, it's time to spray the base color. Yep, it's already that time again to point out another mistake that I made so you won't have to. Like I previously mentioned, it's best to use a sandable primer, but I didn't sand it before I moved on to the color base. This left me with a very rough primer base, so when I shot the color onto it, the color was also adapting that very rough base. It's a lot easier and safer to try to sand the primer smooth than it is to try to sand the color smooth. So let's go ahead and take a little bit of extra time and sand the primer. If you want to make sure this is a really good job, then it's best to use a 1500 grit and wet sand it down and make sure it's nice and smooth for the next coat. After cleaning the surface and masking an area that I want to keep matte black, it's time for some color. What I will be using today is factory color from Mopar, so it should be a perfect match for my Jeep. Yep, you guessed it. Another critical error on my part. These small 6 ounce cans of paint are sold by local dealers as paint repair kits for small scuffs and chips. That should have been my first clue that this was not the right product to use. My second clue was just how thin the paint was on my test spray and that it comes in small cans. I would not recommend using these kits and would advise using some other color match paints that you can find online. This stuff was very thin and the solvents they used was super strong in order to bond to existing paint. This strong solvent would actually dissolve the primer even after it had 24 hours to cure, marring the color with gray and making me add more layers of paint. Now that we have our color down, and I used about four coats, it's time to wet sand it down to a nice smooth surface before we shoot the clear coat on. This will help minimize the orange peel effect with the clear coat. When wet sanding, it's best to use the 1500 grit and go slowly until you see a nice, even, and consistent surface over the entire piece. If you see something that looks like water ripples in the paint, you're not yet flat. The ripples is actually paint that's not been affected by the sandpaper and thus in a valley. What we need to do is keep sanding until everything has the same matte look. Now, I don't know if you noticed this yet, but the sanding pads that I'm using was actually from the headlight restoration kit that I mentioned in the grocery list. Do not do this. 
just buy some nice 800 and 1500 grit sandpaper. It's only a few bucks. When I filmed this, it was in the middle of the coronavirus epidemic and I didn't want to go to the hardware store just to get some sandpaper. Finally, I masked up and got the proper tools. This also leads me to the second problem that I ran into, and that has to do with just how thin the paint is. Even after four coats of paint, just the slightest brush of the sanding pad on one of the edges would reveal primer, causing me to have to put on yet another coat of paint. The paint was simply not thick enough. After sanding everything down, I had to put another two coats of paint on. Luckily, I got two cans, so I just barely had enough. After wet sanding the base color flat, it's time for the clear coat. This gives it that nice wet look that we all want and will help protect your hard work with a nice clear shell. Again, multiple coats, I did three, and allow a few minutes between each coat. And also allow for another 24 hours of cure time. Now this is going to produce a bit more orange peel again, but break out your 1500 grit sandpaper and start wet sanding again. This is going to be a lot of hard work, but it's all going to be worth it, trust me. Once you're done with the 1500 grit sandpaper, let's go ahead and move on to the 3000 grit pad and make sure it's nice and super smooth before we move on to the compound and polish. I highly recommend polishing it by hand due to just some of the complex corners and edges that the machine can actually mar up. By the time you're done with this thing, you're going to have a whole lot of sweat equity invested into this. Now after quite a bit of vigorous polishing and rubbing, you should wind up so some results pretty close to this, if not better. And at this point, I'm on my probably fourth day of this project, and I am very, very happy with the results. Now it's time to invert the masking around the gauge cluster and paint the area matte black to match the metal rings that I already painted. For the edges, I used some high-end fog tape to prevent bleeding and some generic 3M masking tape for the rest of the area. Since I had already amassed the gauge cluster after priming, this area is already primed and ready to go. I bet you're thinking, what could go wrong now? You're almost done with the project and you're using the right tools. Well, something happened with the frog tape. I either didn't allow enough cure time or the frog tape just got too a little too attached to my clear coat. Which is really interesting considering the generic 3M tape had no issues whatsoever, but the frog tape started to peel back the clear coat, even after I gave the clear coat 24 hours to cure. This mistake was almost crushing at this point, but luckily I was able to do a little bit of wet sanding with the 1500 and a 3000 grit, give it a little bit more buff, and we were back ready to go. Now I always say Jeeps are as unique as their owners, and it's time to give my Jeep the signature touch that will truly make it my blue JL. As an artist by trade, I couldn't stop at just painting the inserts. I had to take it to the next level and I created a silhouette artwork to go over my passenger side showing off the city I live in with some nice easter eggs thrown in for good measure. I did the artwork in Photoshop and had a local sign shop cut it out of the vinyl for me so I can apply it to the dash once it was done. To apply it, I use what's called the wet apply method that uses a little bit of soapy water to create a thin layer of film that allows you to position the vinyl before you place it permanently. Now, just a little background on me. Some 20 years ago, I worked at a sign shop just after high school doing this very thing, applying vinyl on signs and cars, and I thought to myself, I know what I'm doing. Turns out that I don't quite know everything after some 20 years. The wet apply solution I thought was like a 10 to 90 of regular soap, dish soap versus water, but boy was I way off. It's more like 1 to 99. Just a few drops will do it, and it'll help break up the surface and prevent the soap from interfering with the adhesives. After applying the panel and the decal with my soapy mixture, it completely ruined the vinyl and it would not stick at all. Getting these vinyl decals cut at a local shop can cost quite a bit since they typically have a minimum, and I felt the cost for me recutting it would be almost as much as investing in a home vinyl cutter and remaking it myself. So that's what I did. I also have future plans for this cutter, so look forward to seeing more in the future. Applying the decal is relatively easy. First, remove the paper backing, wet both the decal and the surface, and apply the decal and reposition if needed. Then all you need to do is squeegee out the water from underneath the decal so the vinyl can adhere to the surface. Once that's done, slowly peel back the transfer tape. 
You may have a few air or water bubbles, but it's easy to push them out to the closest edge. Later on, I found out that using paper transfer tape is better when doing the wet apply than the clear stuff. After setting the decal, you're almost done. All we need to do is just reverse the removal process, making sure to reconnect the airbag and the car battery, and enjoy your new dash. Overall, this project took me five days, mainly due to the number of times I've messed up. But anything worth doing is worth doing right, and the results speak for themselves. If you want to just keep it simple and do some color from a rattle can, it could be a day job. But if you really want to get that factory finished, then I highly suggest taking the time to wet sand and clear coat, even if it means spending a bit more time. This project was not all around difficult or technical, but it was more time consuming, and I highly recommend it to anyone who really wants to truly personalize their own Jeep. Well, that about wraps up this episode, and I really hope you learned a lot from my mistakes. If you do like this video, please hit the thumbs up, share, and subscribe for more content. I have a lot more content on the way, including some fun projects with the new vinyl cutter and some great trail footage from my first trip off-roading. As always, stay safe out there, keep the shiny side up, and I'll see you on the trails.